welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we really think of tonight as uh, the beginning of sort of the high school journey from really here to graduation, career, and college planning. It begins here because this is really the first time that there are these things out in the world called prerequisites, which affect what they can take one year, you know, where they have to take certain courses, they have to get grades in certain courses, where up until now they've been moving along, taking whatever is assigned to them. And so it becomes a little bit more complicated. The reason we do this program at this time of the year is that we will be meeting, and when I say we, I really mean Karen Ziomek, will be meeting with your students to go over this same information. However, we want you to have it first. So when they come home with the choice sheets, the, the um, we've got them in yellow this year that you see, you'll have an understanding of what they're making decisions about. Now, I don't want to sort of give the impression that it's carte blanche for ninth graders. Um, there still are a lot of required classes in ninth grade. It, it, it loosens up a little bit in 10th. A lot more elective choice in 11th and 12th grade. But because some of the decisions that they make for ninth grade will have implications <coughs> three years from now, we're going to present sort of what happens and we encourage all of the students to do a four-year plan. And while that may change, they may make decisions, you know, as they get exposed to things, if they don't start out thinking four years down the road, they may miss opportunities. And so while we recognize that they will, may change their mind, they really need to see all of high school and what those options are to understand how to back up taking AP stats perhaps in senior year and what that means that they need to do in junior year and sophomore year and freshman year. So we, we are not trying to intimidate them, but we're trying to get them to think a little bit differently. And the same thing will happen when they go to college. They will need to understand that what they take freshman year and so on will have implications. And so the planning process is quite a bit different um, from here on in. And so that the goal of tonight is to get you the information so that after Ms. Ziomek meets with students and they bring their choice sheets home, that you can have conversations about that. And before I even go through the information, what I want to stress is that if you have questions after tonight, you know, the, the choice sheets come home, um, something comes up that you sort of said, oh, I don't quite remember what the implication of this was, please give us a call. Um, the thing I think for me to stress is that it's not a one-shot deal tonight. This is an ongoing process. We hope to hear from you over the next four years as you're making decisions and choices with your, your children. So let me get into... Um, there are, there's one additional guidance counselor besides Ms. Yomek and myself who strictly works with kids at the high school level. So what happened is that in seventh grade, I worked with your students. In eighth grade, Ms. Yomek worked with your students because we have the ability to meet with the team a couple of times a week. In high school, we break up um, students alphabetically. So the goal is that we begin working with them freshman year and that by the time we get to the point of writing references for college and the job search, we know your students very well. So Ms. Mandia will pick up students um, by her part of the alphabet in high school. Um, and so high school works a little bit differently. The teachers don't <coughs> meet all at once as a team because students are in classes all four blocks of the day. So what I hope you have an understanding of by the time you leave tonight are frontier graduation requirements, college admissions requirements, credits for graduation, the attendance policy in high school, course levels, grade point average and how the course levels affect that, course sequences by department, so we'll go over English sequencing, social studies sequencing, and so on. We're going to put up some sample questions um, and then do a question and answer about the college admissions process. After that, what I'd like, I'm sorry, about the, the high school scheduling process. After that, what I'd like to briefly talk about is the 
programs that we do for students after this year. Um, because sometimes this is our chance to get you in a group and talk about programming for sophomores, juniors, and seniors and what you can expect from here on in. Okay, so what you have on a white sheet for you to take home is a four-year plan. On the left column, what it says is the department, for instance, social studies, and the suggested year in at Frontier, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, that you take certain courses. We talk about what we require here at Frontier to graduate from high school and what the state colleges here in Massachusetts require. And where there are private school differences as we go along, we're going to talk about that as well. And this, what we hope you do with this, is you just have this as a resource for the next four years as you're going along. Now students will add electives, they'll do some different things, but these are the core requirements. So in high school, um, in order to graduate, students need to earn credits. And to earn credits, you must get a grade of 60 or above, a D minus or above, to get credits for that class. You must have a passing grade. Here at Frontier, we are on a schedule that's called the long block. Um, when I was in high school, there were seven periods a day. They lasted about 45 minutes and they were year-long classes. And about 15 years ago, there were some studies that looked at time on learning. And with a seven period day, passing time at least seven times, starting to take our attendance, winding down, there was an awful lot of time on learning that was lost. And so a lot of schools went to what's called a long block schedule, where you take four basic blocks in high school each semester, they're about 85 minutes a piece, and you complete a year's worth of material either from the end of August when we start school till January when first semester ends, or from mid-January to when we finish in June. And when you look at that, um, you're able to do four classes, first semester, or four blocks of classes, first semester and four second semester. So. We, I'm going to go a little bit further into the blocks, but basically students are taking four blocks each semester. A full block, you have the potential of earning five credits, so 20 credits each semester, 40 credits for the year. So if a student is with us freshman through senior year, at 40 credits a year, they have the potential of earning 160 credits. They must earn a minimum of 140 to graduate. And then they need to be in certain departments, and we'll talk about that as we go through the department. But the basic structure are four blocks each semester. So what your child's schedule looks like now is that they have science, social studies, math, English, math lab, English lab for three quarters of the day. And that's on a rotating schedule, and one of, or, or two of those classes fall out a day. It's on what's called the waterfall. But they're with a team of teachers, those same teachers, for three quarters of the day, all year long. And then a quarter of their day is spent in exploratories, whether they're in band or chorus or exploring music, whether they're in an art class or a theater class, whether they're in a computer class, a Spanish class, a French class, but they're in exploratories. Band and strings are year-long exploratories, but all of the others are half-year classes. When you go to high school, these are the four blocks that I mentioned. There's A, B, C, and D. If you're in an everyday class, any one of these blocks, you earn five credits. In all of our academic classes, science classes, math classes, English classes, social studies and the like, required classes, are every day for the semester. There are some every other day classes, things like health and gym and art and music history and things of that nature. Many of the electives are every other day. 
and you earn two and a half credits for each every other day class. And when you have a two and a half credit class, you have a matching two and a half credit class the other day. And it's basically odd and even days at the high school. We refer to them, you'll hear the people refer to them as red and blue, some schools one and two, but basically on even days of the month, you're in classes that end with an A2 or an A, you know, a, a D2, and on odd days of the month, you're in a class that's A1, B1, so on and so forth. And so these blocks last half of the calendar year for the school, but they're about 85 minutes long. And in high school, there's an attendance policy. Students must have seat time for 90% of classes. So we break it down by semester. And students will not be given credit for a class if they miss more than 10 days of an every day, a five credit class, or five days of an every other day class. Um, so, this is a little bit different because not only do students have to earn the passing grade of a D, a 60 or better, but they must be in attendance for those days. Now obviously if someone's in a serious car accident, something of that nature, um, a doctor can excuse them beyond the 10 days, um, that sort of thing. But other than that, in, in general, that is the attendance policy. And we do keep students posted and send letters when people get to the halfway mark so that parents have that information for planning purposes. Okay. And another thing that's different is that in high school, courses are leveled. And we have four levels. Level zero is PE. So students are required to take physical education, but it doesn't factor into their grade point average. The majority of classes are level one. They're college preparatory classes. <coughs> level two are honors level classes, <coughs> and level three are advanced placement, or AP classes. Classes done here at high school that are college level work. And what happens is that those weighted averages affect grade point average. The higher the level class, the more points that go into the grade point calculation. So the payoff for taking more rigorous classes is the fact that your GPA, your grade point average, will be higher. And when you look at college entrance requirements, the vast majority of schools still start off by looking at objective criteria. Your grade point average and the rigor of the classes you've taken and your SAT or ACT scores. So that's why we encourage students who are capable of doing more rigorous work to challenge themselves. And this marking System, the grade point system shows that if you take, let's say, an AP class and get an A minus in it, four points will be factored into your GPA. Whereas if you take a 4.3 for an AP, four for an honors, and a 3.7 for a college preparatory class. So even if you don't do quite as well, in the AP class or an honors class, potentially the same number of points can go in, and if you do quite well, more points will go into your grade point average. Okay? And this chart is available in the program of studies. Um, we have copies of it in our office. It's, it's replicated so that people have an understanding um, when they're looking at that sort of the incentive for taking those more rigorous classes. At this point, um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Karen Ziovec, who's going to go department by department and explain the offerings by grade. Mm -hmm. 
night, everyone. All right, so what you have on the yellow sheets is what I'm going to be talking about. So by the time I'm finished talking, you see I'll spread out your yellow sheet. Um, and just so you know, as Shelly mentioned, I'm, I'll be in the classroom with your children on March 17th. So it'll be after that date that they'll come home also with their own set. And um, we're throwing a lot of information at you. It's a lot to <laughs> think about, a lot to remember. I'll tend to just say off the top, it kind of gives you the illusion that there's a whole lot of choice in ninth grade. There isn't. <laughs> how many of you have upperclassmen already? So you kind of know how the process works. So we're giving you an overview of four years. And as Mr. Modesto said, our objective is similar in that we're trying to lay the groundwork so that you have as many choices, your child has as many choices as possible when you get to 12th grade. And if you really study that white sheet, you'll see that one column is what they require, what we require for high school graduation from the frontier. The column next to it is what state colleges in Massachusetts are looking for. So we're kind of, that's our goal when we're <coughs> sitting and scheduling these kids is to accomplish, achieve both of those so that when they get to be a senior, they can go off and make good choices. Okay, so English, right away, grade nine English. There you have it, that's the choice. So everybody gets it. So if you look at the yellow sheet, that's the top part where it says all students in grade nine will be following courses. English nine, there's no choice, everybody gets it. Um, as they progress through, same thing, grade 10, grade 11, one additional choice, the AP English language course. Grade 12, several more choices. Um, your standard English class, your advanced placement English literature, um, college writing, Italian literature, um, these, up from here up, satisfies your English graduation requirement from here down is, as it says, elective. So, again, I crossed that bridge when you come to it. Math is probably the slide I need to spend the most time on with you today. Um, as we speak, Mrs. Wozni, their math teacher, is making their math, creating their math recommendations for me. Um, she will also share them with your children so they know what they should be signing up for. Um, so you know the choices are um, Algebra 1, um, Algebra 1A and 1B, which is essentially Algebra 1. It's just spread out over the course of the year. So again, throwing a lot at you. It is different in middle school in that the course uh, the courses are year long. When they get to high school, the courses are semester. So if they have algebra 1A and 1B, they're going to have algebra 1A in the fall semester and 1B in the spring semester. Those two courses together are algebra 1. If you've got a real high-powered math student and they're achieving A's consistently, maybe B's, high B's, um, algebra 1 might be for them. Um, majority of students in eighth grade, I would say, if I have her percentage on it, I would say two-thirds are signed up for the algebra 1A, 1B. Um, moving on, the geometry is an option for some. Those that end up with the algebra 1 could potentially take geometry in the spring. Those that are in um, algebra 1 this year as eighth graders will go to that geometry if they achieve an average of a B. So this is a little more complicated because it is different for every student. So that's where you can wait till the 17th and we can talk about it then. Um, Mrs. Wozniak will probably share that um, recommendation with your child between now and then. Um, you may be pretty sure where yours belongs. If you're not, give us a call. Um, as has already been mentioned, nothing is final today. <coughs> nothing is final in March. Things can, we still have a quarter of the year, a third of the year left, so things can certainly change. Question. Is algebra 1 over the course of the whole year? No, one says. And so then you can go on to geology. You could, yeah. You don't have to. Is the algebra 1A and 1B a lot of the review? Um, depending what they How does that compare to what this year? Um, depends what they have. They're already in Algebra 1, then 1A and 1B would be repeating the course at a slower pace. Um, if they're in the Algebra 1 this year, but they're not 
doing well or is below a B average, then they're going to get recommended to repeat that course. And just so you know, I mean, if you stop and think about it, because we're on a semester schedule in the high school, there literally are eight semesters, eight for them to do math. We don't typically fill all eight semesters with math. There are kids who do, but probably exhaust most of our math requirements if you do that. Courses if you do that. So there's plenty of time if you decide, okay, let's just do one A, one B. Then sophomore year could be geometry, potentially algebra two. Junior year could be a pre-calculus. And then in senior year, there's still time for an advanced placement course. So even beginning with 1A and 1B, there's plenty of time to fit in what they need. If they're real high-powered math student and they're real driven, then yeah, we'll, we'll put in the, could be algebra one, geometry. Sophomore year could be algebra two, pre-calculus. Junior year could be AP stats. Senior year could be AP calculus. So there's room to fit it in, but we don't really know. Most eighth graders don't know what they want to do when we're registering. So plenty of time to fit it. Um, so you see everything else that we're off, that's offered here. And um, that's, it's, again, different for everybody, so don't hesitate to ask <coughs> you have those questions. Okay, so social studies, um, 20 credits are required, which equates to four courses. Um, grade nine, everybody will be signed up for either the World History One or the World History One X. And again, sort of, when you see a course with X, it's honors. Um, kids who really like history, um, who really like to write, um, we should sign them up for the One X. A little hesitancy in my voice because as the person who's doing a lot of the scheduling, sometimes those courses don't always fit. So um, it's a little premature to talk about conflicts in their schedule, but it happens. So sometimes to make everything else work, even though a student really wants the one X, we might have to schedule the, the one. But it's kind of hard to explain that if you haven't lived it. As we go through that, you'll see what I mean. And, um, Ms. Dallin will show us some sample schedules. So again, grade 10, U.S. history, grade 11, <clears throat> grade 12. Those get automatically kind of put in. You, you know, when your child moves up the, in, in, into the grades, you'll see it'll be a different color, kind of a different format, but it'll all correspond to the grade. Um, I want to mention before I forget to hold on to this. This is one to hold on to because the one that you wouldn't have, to, the kids wouldn't have, the kids wouldn't have to turn into us on the bottom really states what their particular course needs for high school graduation, and that'll remain the same for four years. So it does vary from class to class as we update requirements and the state updates requirements. But this will be the class of 2018. I'm sorry, what's the difference between this one and one X? Um, faster pace. Um, perhaps um, some additional content that they might put in so it's really faster for kids that are more interested in this subject area. Okay, science. Um, a heavy year in science in grade nine because they're taking a whole year of biology. Again, not really an option for them. You see at the top, of course, 1206, biology, nature of life, biology, 1207. They have to take it. Um, so we automatically schedule biology one for the fall, biology two for the spring. They are then tested for their science MCAS in June of their freshman year. So it's all fresh in their heads. Um, so not really an option there. <coughs> Chemistry happens as a 10th grader. And then your children will have to take two more science courses to fulfill their graduation requirements. And again, that starts to be where we're having individual conversations with these kids and saying, what are you interested in? What do you want to do? Do you want to go into the medical field? Well, you know, we need certain maths and science and trying to tailor a schedule that works for them. But everybody starts with the same base, biology and chemistry. <coughs> 
Um, additional requirements, world language, <coughs> two years of the same language. Um, if we can't fit that in in ninth grade, and you'll see that that'll sometimes be a challenge. Um, again, because we have eight semesters to work with, plenty of time to get in two courses, which equates to two semesters. But it really needs to be in the same language. So if you start with Spanish 1, then we're going to try to sign up for Spanish 2. But this does carry a prerequisite with it, so that you need to maintain that C average to go to the next level. Um, health, 10 credits, which is four courses. Ideally, we try to do health 1 as a freshman, health 2 as a 10th grader, followed by health 3 and health 4. And the same with phys ed. Um, four courses over four years. And does it happen that sometimes a student can't fit in that as in one year? Yeah, it does happen. And we just make up for it the following year. Because those courses are every other day, there's a little more flexibility sometimes in putting together the schedule. And then we finish up with other electives and they have a 2.5 credit, again when I say 2.5 credit, that's every other day requirement um, that they have to get in over the course of four years um, for graduation. It's pretty easy to do, um, whether it's a basic art course or a wood one or something <coughs> like that. So I think that wraps up curriculum. Any questions on that? Go ahead. Special education is a year-long course? No, it's um, every other day for one semester. Okay. So usually alternating with the health course. Um, one thing I haven't mentioned specifically was kids who are in a wind ensemble or band. Um, that also, that goes for the year every other day. But very often we alternate health and phys ed with kids who have a band or the health and phys ed alternate themselves. If we don't have bands, there's the various <coughs> ways to do it. But we are only working with four blocks, so it's hard to spread them out <coughs> sometimes. So. That leads us right into sample schedules. <laughs> um, this is what a high school schedule would look like mail time. Um, so what happens timing wise is, Ms. Yamik's already explained she's going to meet with the 8th graders March 17th. They will be given the same sheets that you have tonight, and they'll be asked to bring the choice sheet back signed by their parent. So we don't want them filling it out on the spot and turning it in. We want them to have those conversations with you and get your permission for the choices that they're making. Um, some students may you know, not want as rigorous a schedule without your encouragement as you would want them to have. Um, some people may, some students decide on their own to drop band and you may want them to continue. Um, there are things that, that happen that need some conversations and that's why we require a signature before we will actually input their requests into the system. Um, and so from there, um, we are really entering those requests and finding out which courses are have enough sign-ups so that they're going to run in a particular year. We're looking at teacher schedules and we're, we're making what is called a master schedule. Um, we try to do as much of that work as we can uh, before the school year ends, but the guidance staff is here five days after the school year ends. We come back five days early. Um, to work out anything and to register students that it might have come into the district over the summer. But what happens is that a schedule is mailed home typically about the third Monday in August. And at that point, it will have teacher names, it will have room numbers, it will have how many credits. And at that point, you are able to see what schedule. Now if there is something that happens as we're, as we're inputting it, as Ms. Yomik said, if there is a conflict, your child wanted to take Spanish 1, B, and Geometry X, and something was a conflict. We're going to ask them when they fill out these choice sheets to put not only their first choice of 40 credits, but to put some alternates, both two and a half credit alternates and five credit alternates so that we can look at, you know, if, if there is a conflict between one or more courses, what their next choice would have been. 
But very often, if there's something that we're not sure, we're looking at the, the sheets, and you're going to get a phone call from the counselor saying, you know, or the, the, the student will be called to the counselor's office and say, you know, here, would you bring this home and bring a slip back with what you, you would like to do? Um, but the third week in August, this is going to get mailed home. And so it's very specific about what the schedule is. It's going to say that semester one, this child is going to have algebra one. They're going to have biology one. They're going to have an every other day health one class. That is going to be opposite band one semester. Gym is going to be opposite band the next semester. And then they are going to have honors world history one. And then you get to see what they have semester two. Now, this is what the schedule looks like that's mailed home. This, I think, makes better sense of it without the teacher names, without the room numbers. That same schedule I've put up by block just so that it's easier to see. So the Algebra 1, the Health Opposite Band, the World History, the Bio 1. And then second semester, their Bio <coughs> 2, the Phys Ed Opposite Band. This particular student selected to take Latin in ninth grade and English 9. So they made a choice when they did this schedule that they weren't going to do a second semester of math. Someone who really likes math might have decided to do Algebra 1 and perhaps Honors Geometry instead of the Latin the first semester ninth grade. The things that Ms. Yomek said they didn't really have a choice about were Biology 1 and Biology 2. The fact that they had to take English. They had to do a world history, but they got to pick whether they were doing it at the honors level or the regular level. And then this student wanted to do band. And so because that's an every other day class all year long, one semester the health went opposite and one semester the PE went opposite. So those were some of the choices that that family made. They wanted to start their foreign language in ninth grade. They didn't want to do two semesters of math. They wanted to do band. Whereas if we look at a different schedule, again, this is what would get mailed home. But let's look at it this way, without the teacher names, without the room numbers. So this person did world history at the regular level, not the honors level. They had to do the world history, but they chose the level. They also did English 9. They also did Bio 1 and Bio 2. This person was recommended to take algebra over two semesters at a slightly slower pace. So that took up two blocks. They're not a band student, but this student was on an IEP. And they had, as a result of their team IEP meeting, a recommendation to do a skills lab every other day. And that's what went opposite health and PE first and second semester. So once you get into high school, schedules aren't going to look exactly alike. There will be some things that students will take, everyone will take, like English 9. But there will be other things that will either be choices or recommendations, for instance, as to math level. And so schedules start to look different from student to student. Now, world history could have fallen first semester, or it could have fallen second semester. The same thing with English. Now, bio one has to be first semester, and bio two, second semester. But one student could have had English first semester, and another student next door could have had it second semester, just how it all fits. Does that make sense so far? All right. Now, before yeah. go back, um, as Ms. Yomik said, you're good. Students have to do English one five credit course in English at a minimum, 
in 9th, 10th, and 11th, and 12th grade. She had said that math was the most complicated slide. And the reason why we recommend looking at four years now is because, as she mentioned, if your student is a math student, that's their passion, um, they want to go into a career where you need to have a strong background in math, they may want to plan now, how am I going to get through all of the math electives at the highest level that Frontier offers? AP Calculus is a year-long class. AP Statistics is a year-long class. In order to do AP Calculus or AP Statistics, the prerequisite to go into either one of those is pre-calc. The prerequisite to go into pre-calc is Algebra 2. The prerequisite to go into Algebra 2 is Geometry. The prerequisite to go into Geometry is Algebra 1. So when I work with students in my office, as they have questions about this, we almost start senior year and work our way backwards when you're trying to do that kind of planning. So that begins to explain why the four-year plan becomes so critical. And again, as I mentioned early on, not that people might not change their mind, but if right now your child has a passion for math, then you want to look at not precluding things too early on. They can change their mind down the road, but you want to sort of work your way backwards. Now, all students need to get through at least Algebra 2. If you want to go to a four-year school, you need to have gotten through at least Pre-Calc, because that's what the expectation is for your schools is going to be. So different students will stop at different places. They all have to have at least 20 credits in math, but people will go to different course levels depending on where their interests are, what else they want to take that's competing against that, and what their career goals are. Do they want to go to a two-year school? Do they want to go to a four-year school? Because the requirements for admission will be different. We, as you would, perhaps when you looked at the four-year plan, you might have noticed that we require more history than certainly the state colleges do, but really colleges in general. So by taking Frontier's requirements, they're going to fill all the history requirements that they need. But we have electives in addition. With science, we said you have to have 20 credits. We're requiring the bio 1 and the bio 2 and the chemistry. But how you fulfill that, uh, those other requirements is up to you. But when we meet with your student in counseling appointments, if they tell us they want to go to a four-year school, we're going to tell them they need to take physics. Because most students that go to four-year schools have had physics. So even though you don't have to have physics to graduate from Frontier, if you want to go to a four-year school, as your student's guidance counselor, we're going to tell them you should have physics, because that's part of your family's plan in terms of your goals. If a student struggles with science, struggles with math, they're not going to start off at a four-year school, they might choose to do a different elective in science to fulfill that last five credits. We have other people that are science you know, they're just going to gravitate toward it. They take every single offering we have in the science department. So schedules look very different depending on, on goals and desires. Um, we said you need 10 credits as frontier graduation requirement. If you want to go to a four-year school, some schools require three years of the same foreign language. If you want to go to a four-year school and major in international business or international finance, they're going to want you to have had four years of the same foreign language, anything international. So what you need to do, again, dependent on your goals. And that's part of the conversation that we're having as we talk with your students each year um, as they're making those choices. Because they start to have much more flexibility, especially after 10th grade. 
So we listed electives in all of these departments, and you may say, well, how do I know what all of those electives are? Well, we give you the electives that ninth graders are eligible to take on their choice sheet, and they'll get different choice sheets in 10th grade and 11th grade and 12th grade. But what we have, very thick, is a program of studies. We put that program of studies up online so that parents can look at it at any point in time. It's on the, if you look at Frontier's website, there's the guidance tab, and as part of the guidance tab, there is a program of studies with a course description. So maybe you look at music and films and you don't know really what you cover in music and films. So you go to the program of studies and you get a description and it tells you what that teacher focuses on, how many credits, what the prerequisite is, did you have to have another course before that, did you have to have a certain grade in another course before that. Uh, Ms. Yomet mentioned the prerequisite of a C or better. So there are two departments where you must have a C or better to move on in that, the entirety of that department, math department and foreign language. And the reason is, it is sequential learning in math and foreign language. If you don't get this concept, you're not going to get the next one. If you don't understand this basic in a foreign language, you're not going to be able to move on. So the entire department of math and foreign language, you must have a C to move on from one course to the next. But there are particular courses that you might have to have a C or better to move on in. For instance, if you want to take the elective of journalism under the English department, you need to have a C in English in order to take journalism. So how are you going to find that information? That's going to be in the program of studies. That's all going to be lined up. The program of studies is available in hard copy up here in the library, in our office as well as online for people that just prefer to look at it in hard copy. We have even more opportunities for juniors and seniors beyond the courses listed in the program of studies. And I know it's a lot of information, but sort of while you're in the room, I'm going to take advantage of mentioning things, even though it's not applicable for ninth grade, just so that you have heard the terminology when it comes home on their junior and senior choice sheets. We've already sort of alluded to the fact that we have AP offerings. Um, we actually are currently offering nine courses in AP. Some of them run every year, some of them run every other year. That's a large number of AP offerings for a school of our size. In addition to that, we have virtual high school offerings. So courses that we don't teach here at Frontier. We are part of a, it's, it's, I was going to say national, but it's actually an international group. Um, where courses are taught online. It could be a teacher in California, it could be someone in American school, you know, in another country. Um, it could be in Danvers, Mass. I mean, it, the teachers that are part of this could be anywhere. Students are able to take classes that we don't offer at Frontier as juniors and seniors online, including additional AP classes. We offer dual enrollment for juniors and seniors that have a 3.0 or above by the time they get to junior year. The majority of our students choose to do that at Greenfield Community College because that's the college that's closest to us, but we have had students do it at UMass and other places. So if a school allows dual enrollment and it's feasible for students to get there, they can apply to do that. We have some students um, who take one class and they might do all the rest here. We have others that might choose to do full schedules, especially senior year. And that's something that we talk to students about. We have some students, junior and senior year, who choose to fulfill their electives not with one of these courses, but doing something called an independent study, where they are working with a faculty member here on a particular topic of research. They need to do a presentation to the administration at the end of the semester on that research, everything that they have done. But it gives them 
an opportunity to study a specific topic or subject in depth under a faculty member whose area of expertise they're interested in. So in addition to the electives in the program of studies, there are some pretty interesting, I think, and unique opportunities that juniors and seniors can take advantage of. And I'm not asking you to remember all of this tonight, but just to sort of know that those opportunities are out there as they go down the road. The reason that things are pretty prescribed freshman and sophomore year is that in addition to meeting Frontiers graduation requirements, students must meet the state graduation requirements of the MCAS exams um, to get a diploma. And the state says that the sophomore year is the year that you take English and math MCAS exams that are the high stake tests for graduation and that after you take your first high school science class, whether you know that's in ninth grade or 10th grade, you take the science exam. So we don't want our students taking all three in one year. So biology is done in ninth grade so that they then take that bio exam at the end of the ninth grade year and they'll take English and math. English is offered March um, of their sophomore year the math exam is May of their sophomore year. And so we want to make sure that they have met those requirements if things are pretty structured and front-loaded so that they don't have the opportunity not to take um, courses that they need in preparation for that. And after that, the schedule frees up a bit um, more in terms of elective choices, all the things that would come. Thank you. Or am I back? I got all the questions. Before I go on about what we do for sophomores, juniors, and seniors, can I answer anything about the scheduling at this point? Anything that I covered that wasn't clear or that I didn't cover? Yes. Me, I'm making you repeat. It's world okay. history, English, and looks like world language if they choose it in the ninth grade. That's all year. Um, no, English is um, a half year class. So it's, one semester. it's one semester. It can fall either first or second semester. Um, world language is one semester. They might take it in ninth grade or they might hold off. But they cover a full year's worth of material either from the end of August to the, about the third week in January when our first semester ends or from January to June. So classes that were a year long when they were 45 minutes, seven periods a day, are now done in half of a year because we've doubled the amount of time on the block schedule. So when we say minimum of two years of French, that's two semesters of French because you're doing French one in a semester, French two in a semester. Some students might do French one in French two in a year if it fell <coughs> that way for them. Others might do French one sophomore year and French two junior year or whatever. One other question. Yep. They're in advanced math. That's not algebra one. So if they're in the eighth grade right now and they've been in advanced math in seventh grade, in advanced math in eighth grade, and they have a B or better, that they will have finished Algebra 1 by the end of 8th grade. And they would then, in more than likely, be recommended to go on to geometry. Mm -hmm. or, or geometry honors. Well, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just quickly, um, we lock what your AP classes offerings are. Like, you said there were eight or yeah. the So it's AP Calculus and AP Statistics in the math department. It's AP English Language, which is 11th grade English, and AP English Literature, which is 12th grade English. The two in the Science Department are AP Chemistry and AP Environmental Science. The two in History are AP European History and AP Government, and the ninth is AP Computer Science. Have you had students take the computer-based AP courses in foreign language? Are there foreign language courses or accelerated foreign language? Um, not, not taught by um, the department of members. It's basically right. one through four. Have we had students 
who have chosen to do an AP exam in a foreign language? Yes. Mm -hmm. That was one thing I was wondering, like, do you have to take a marked AP class if you are planning no, to like it, No, as a matter of fact, um, what the college board requires if you're a school that offers AP exams is that if you have a student that wants to take an AP exam, even if they have not taken a class, and, and that happens mostly with language. I mean, we have students who have backgrounds, maybe their native language is what is a world language, and so they choose to and request to take the um, for that world language exam, even though they haven't had a course because they know the language very well. I mean, that happens absolutely. Great questions. Yes. Um, if you're do, if you're enrolled in strings, that's uh, are the only other electives or the other I think it's optative strings that help in the fifth ed. That's typically what ninth graders take. Yes. I mean, later on, if they're doing strings, freshman, you know sophomore, junior, senior, they might take an art class opposite it, they might take um, a woodshop class opposite it. I mean, there are other two and a half credit classes under the electives that could match up with the strings. So, when you go here, um, a lot of the courses in computers, um, industrial technology, I mean, we typically refer to that as woodshop, music, the performing arts like theater, journalism is in every other day class, playwriting in every other day class. So there are other two and a half credit classes besides health and PE that might match up with that every other day band class or that every other day strings class. So if you miss, don't do strings in ninth grade, can you continue in 10th? Yes. And then is there the tech ed class that was offered in middle school where they learn typing skills and such like, is that offered in ninth grade? There are other classes that are electives in information technology that students could take in high school. They can't be in the same middle school class, but there are other technology classes in high school. So that if they didn't take a technology class, multimedia A or B, and they want to get exposure, they certainly could take electives at the high school level. But not really a ninth grade? They could, if it fits, but they would have to give up something else to, to, to do it. So, I mean, you're not going to be able to fit in strings and foreign language and double maths. And, you know, it's just not going to all fit in ninth grade. Yes? Question. So, you know, being in the English would be comparable to strings. Yes, the same time frame, yes. Did you say you did three years of a language, most four-year college? I said a lot of four-year schools outside of the state schools, the private schools, do look at for three years of the same foreign language, yes. Mm -hmm. so, so because you have eight semesters, you might do a foreign language freshman year, you might do one sophomore year you do might, might do one junior year. A different student might do if it fell like one and two was one was in the fall and two was in the spring. They might not start their foreign language till sophomore year, but doing it two semesters and then do their third junior year. Other people, you know, might do it different years in different ways. But you've got eight semesters to work with, and because the classes are semester long, some years you may be able to fit two years of a foreign language, depending on which you're taking <coughs> in the same year. But if the question is, can you fit in foreign language and strings or band, yes. Mm -hmm. Before graduation, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Before I go on, are there any more questions about scheduling? Okay, let me just hit what, uh, the highlights of what happens in terms of programming after freshman year. Um, part of what Ms. Yomek will do with eighth graders before the year ends is she will bring them um, into the computer lab and do what's called an interest in the computer lab. Oh, right, we now have them see yeah, portable. Yeah, we now do it the other way. We'll bring the computers into the room. Um, the cow carts, the cows on, uh, computers on wheels, sorry. Uh, she'll bring those into the room and they, we will do a middle school interest inventory with the students. Um, we like to do that so that they start to think about what they might want to do. Now we know they'll change their mind um, in lots of cases, 
but we want to give them some exposure to what careers require in terms of training, advanced education. Um, we want them to start thinking about all of those things. But we revisit that in 10th grade um, in a high school model. And we actually look at some budgeting. Um, so if you would like to live in this sort of a house and you know, this sort of a whatever, what you might need to earn. And you know, we look at the whole time frame. The, the um, interest inventory for high school allows them to look at this career requires this degree um, these schools offer this particular major. It's a fully integrated system where they can go as far as finding schools geographically with that major. And we like them to look at that sophomore year because as they look at junior and senior year and they start to have more choices in terms of their <coughs> schedule and electives, we want them to choose wisely. We want them to be thinking about sort of how this will um, affect their future planning. Um, in junior year, we really begin the college career application process in the spring. Um, we talk to students about the fact that it takes about a year and a half to do, um, so we're really starting junior year. Um, I should say that also in sophomore year, we do offer the PSATs. We offer those again in the fall of junior year. Those are the pre SATs, we do the PSATs right here at the school. Um, we talk to them junior year about starting to take their standardized tests, about visiting colleges, about how the level of rigor of what they're choosing for courses will impact how admissions offices looks, look at them, those sorts of things. And we do that through senior year. Um, we bring in the Massachusetts Educational Financing Authority to do financial aid night for parents of juniors and seniors. Um, there is programming above and beyond, but it's, it, what the, the point that I want to make is that it really is an integrated process from here on in. Um, tonight is really about looking at the schedule, but it, it is the beginning of planning to leave and, and being prepared to leave Frontier. Um, and I, I know that it sounds a little scary or it sounds a little premature, but it really is all tied together and, and that's what we're talking to them about and there is a plan for each year. Um, we encourage you to call us to ask us questions. Um, we have parents that come in and meet with us with their students, without their students. Um, we're accessible by email, by phone, in person, whatever you prefer, what's most comfortable for you. Um, so we would be delighted to answer questions at any point in time. Um, I know we threw a lot of information at you tonight, but at some level I'm taking advantage of your presence here and trying to mention things. Um, and I'm happy to take more questions now, or if you're more comfortable asking us questions individually, we can do that as well. So let me once again open the floor to sort of general questions, if there's anything anybody wants to ask. If not, thanks very much for your attention. We appreciate it, and we appreciate your coming, and we'll be here to answer individual questions if you have them. Thank you.